Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Daniel Benjamin. I'm the director of the Dickey Center, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this year's Open Chain Family Great Issues lecture. Um, it's, uh, it's not news that we're uh, always bombarded with images of uh, suffering uh, from around the world. It's part of the modern condition, certainly part of the modern uh, media reality. And those images are, of course, real and urgent. But what is also true, uh, although perhaps less remarked upon, is that we live in what might be called a golden era of poverty reduction. Not long ago, The Economist observed that uh, in 1990, 43% of the population of developing countries lived in extreme poverty, uh, and the absolute number was 1.9 billion people. By 2000, that proportion was down to a third. By 2010, it was 21%. Uh, the global poverty rate has essentially been cut in half in 20 years. Now, a great deal of that occurred in China, and I don't know exactly how much responsibility we can claim for that. Um, but uh, it hasn't happened only in China, according to some uh, to uh, some research. Uh, since 2000, the number of people in extreme poverty outside of China has been cut by nearly 300 million, and these are staggering figures. Well, last year at the Open Chain Family uh, Lecture. We discussed uh, the pursuit of happiness, and we had Carol Graham of Brookings to discuss the new economics of happiness. It seems to me fully appropriate that this year we maybe look at the other side of the calculation and look at the uh, question of poverty reduction and the prospects for that going forward. I particularly want to thank uh, Bill Obenshain of the class of 62, who is here today. And it will surprise none of you as the benefactor for the Open Chain Family Lecture. Um, Bill is now the chairman of uh, the Dickey Center's Board of Visitors, and he's been a terrific supporter of the Human Development Pillar at Dickey. And I want to thank him and his wife Penny, who couldn't be here, for their uh, generous support. Uh, another uh, uh, Bill is, of course, from Chicago, and another great Chicagoan, and one of my oldest, closest friends. Uh, former Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, Neil Wolland, is here to deliver this lecture on poverty and progress in the 21st century. And um, I have to say, Neil has had one of the really extraordinary careers in contemporary Washington. Uh, he is a graduate of uh, Yale College, Yale Law, and has a master's in developmental economics from Balliol College, Oxford, although I'm supposed to add that he is not a development guru, so everyone should know that. Uh, he was the special assistant to three directors of central intelligence and one uh, national security advisor. Uh, during his tenure in that position, he fatally compromised national security by bringing me into government. He has also been a lawyer at the National Security Council staff, and then he uh, moved over uh, to a well-running institution, the Treasury, where he was deputy general counsel and later counsel until the end of the Clinton administration. Uh, uh, during his years out of government, he spent, uh, well, eight of them at the Hartford Insurance uh, Company, finally uh, as a COO of that, uh, of that firm. And he is more recently the longest serving Deputy Secretary of the Treasury. And on two occasions, or one occasion, you were acting Secretary? One. Just one. Yeah, well, good, it's good enough, man. It's good enough for government work. Um, and uh, there, there's really uh, uh, no. Um, shortage of uh, things that he had to, had to deal with. He said this morning, and I say this mindful that his uh, former boss's sister is in the room, he said that he got to go to all the places that didn't have uh, Four Seasons hotels. Uh, and every time I talked to Neil when we were both in government, he seemed to have gone to far worse places than I was going. And I thought that that was uh, noteworthy. Those of you who, uh, who were here for um, Michael Morell's talk during the fall may remember that I, I noted then that it's the deputies who make the government work. Uh, and uh, uh, it's often uh, the deputies who have to deal with the sometimes erratic demands of the principals. And so all, all respect should be paid to anyone who was ever a deputy uh, of an agency. Um, I really can't say uh, enough about Neil's gifts or his record. He's taught me more about government, uh, not all the lessons being pleasant, uh, but taught me more about government than anyone I know and um, remains, I think, one of the most sought after 
advisors in Washington uh, even after his uh, departure from government. So it's a great coup for us to have him here today, and I'm delighted to welcome Neil Wallen. Well, welcome, Neil. So, uh, would you agree that it's been a golden age of, uh, of development and poverty reduction? And if so, why? Well, I think it's been, first of all, uh, Danny, thank you for that overly generous introduction and great to be here. It's um, special to be up here at, at Dartmouth. Um, I think the last 25 years has been a pretty impressive run uh, in general in terms of poverty reduction. I mean, you laid out some of the statistics cited by The Economist. Um, you know, we, we, need, we need to remember, of course, that still one in seven people on planet Earth uh, suffer in extreme poverty, which the World Bank defines as uh, about $1.25 uh, of, of income a day. Um, and so there's still an awful lot to tackle. But I think, you know, you're... Your data lays it out nicely. There's been a lot of gains. They've been pretty broad-based, a huge chunk in China, but um, as well a lot in India, Africa, elsewhere in the developing world. And so I think um, you know, it's one of those circumstances where we should feel pretty good about where we've, where we've been and where we've come to, but still quite unsatisfied about where we need to get to still. And just coincidentally, since we're here at Dartmouth, Jim Kim gave a speech today in Washington about ending uh, extreme poverty. And I think both in the international financial institutions, but also in national capitals, uh, certainly in the developing world, there is still an awful lot of focus as there needs to be on taking the rest of the steps you know, to get to essential extreme poverty alleviation. So um, I guess you know, the lion's share of this has happened in China. Um, and uh, I guess the, the question is whether you think that as China probably flattens out, I mean, 80, something like 85, 86% of its people have been brought out of poverty now. Uh, there are other gains that can be made around the world. And uh, if so, you know, what, where, are the, where are the places that you think uh, will see the greatest uh, achievements? My, my suspicion, although you know it's hard to know, it's going to matter uh, consequentially on sort of what the global macro environment is and what kinds of judgments governments make um, over over the period. But my my pretty strong conviction is there'll be a continuation of poverty reduction pretty much um, across the globe, not in every place and certainly not at equal rates, but that um, as the world continues to grow and as governance institutions continue to improve, and as governments make relatively better choices about inclusion and fiscal policy and investing in people and in infrastructure, that this is a process that will continue. And the pace of that process will vary from region to region and country to country, depending on, again, the macro environment and choices made. So it's not an inevitable, it's not an inevitable thing. I think there's some um, sort of an underlying dynamic that is pointed in the right direction. It's you know not a perfectly linear thing, of course, and its speed we'll have to see. But I think that, um, and there are plenty of, you know, I guess you know, one needs to say there are plenty of risk factors that could interrupt that process or even reverse it over short increments of time or shortish increments of time. But I think that um, you know, the world's going to continue to grow. The, um, the extent to which uh, the developed economy world and the emerging economy world will continue to make investments in countries that still have uh, meaningful poverty um, issues, I think, will continue. And so I'm broadly bullish, but without a particular conviction about what the arc of that curve will look like. So you, you mentioned investment. and. Uh... That's obviously uh, a much bigger part of the picture in terms of what's been achieved in the developing world than it was, say, 30 or 40 years ago, that we've seen a real change there. And the, the uh, old idea that the World Bank would come and, and pay you to build a large dam 
uh, you know, has has kind of come and gone, and a, and a very different model uh, has has emerged. And in fact, there's much a greater diversification, if you will, of the factors driving uh, driving growth. Um, why are we so lucky? Let's put it that way. Well, I think um, for one thing, you know, the, the sort of the basic aid model um, didn't work so well. You look at just for an exa- for example, you look at Africa. And in the 20 years, 1980 to 2000, I think, you know, Africa, GDP in the aggregate, they're obviously puts and takes, uh, went negative by about 10% on a, you know, purchasing power basis. And I think, you know, the, lots, of, lots of data that the sort of basic old model wasn't so effective. In the meantime, I think uh, sort of um, there's been a substantial opening of lots of the world to both with more or less simultaneity, again, very uneven across places. So I'm making a, a bit of a crude generalization to sort of democratic politics and market economics. And those two things, I think, in the aggregate have been quite useful um, uh, and have opened up uh, the developing world to direct foreign investment, to the ability to um, access capital in global markets in many cases, um, to uh, deeper and stronger trade relationships that have put some market forces and, and certainly the private sector behind uh, the basic dynamic of development in ways that um, official sector aid, whether it was bilateral or multilateral, um, you know, could not accomplish on its own, just not big enough, um, even apart from the question of effectiveness. And so I think that, um, you know, if you look at the U.S. government, if you look at the international financial system, I think there's a lot more energy, and you look at, you know, the development arms of lots of other developed country governments, a lot more emphasis on trying to build institutional capacity, governance structures, um, rule of law, the kinds of things that will um, better will create the conditions for letting the private sector um, uh, do its part and make you know help make progress uh, on these issues. Um, so one uh, you know phrase that's been pretty charged over the last decade or two, you know, has been the, the Washington consensus and the whole traditional IMF uh, workout kind of approach uh, uh, to uh, heavily indebted com- uh, countries and the like. And I'm curious, uh, as someone who was, you know, sort of deeply inside the beast when it comes to the international financial institutions and their partners in the, uh, in the uh, treasuries and exchequers of the world, uh, if you think that's been unfairly maligned or... Um, or whether, in fact, there's, there are legitimate critiques to be uh, leveled there? You know, I think, um, so the answer, not surprisingly, is some of each. I think that, um, in general, what the IMF peddles is tough medicine, um, medicine that, you know, countries don't necessarily like or that is politically difficult to implement. Um, and so some amount of the, of the, you know, neuralgia, I would say, about the IMF showing up in your country and sort of, laying out a list of conditions and a set of, you know, at least in, from this perspective, a, a set of diktats is, um, is because it is tough. And it's, you know, tough in circumstances which are kind of at a, in, in, in many cases, at a, at a critical moment. Having said that, you know, um, I think there's probably a chunk of that criticism that is, that is merited that has to do with, you know, um, uh, insufficient attention to context and to um, uh, nuances of politics and economics and culture and you know uh, my own experience with the IMF is they're pretty good but they have a they have a sort of a set of doctrines and they are not um, particularly interested in flexing around those doctrines and sometimes that you know causes um, uh, unhappiness for reasons one can understand. Um, you know, in, in general, it seems to me they create a structural framework and, and wherewithal to help, you know, uh, implement a structural framework that is, um, in general, irreducibly important to the medium or long-term um, macro uh, improvement or macro success of these, of these uh, economies. But it, it's pretty painful in many cases, maybe even most, to get from here to there. And, and I think in, in the main, that's the rub. 
So uh, I want to talk about the macro picture and how that's going to affect uh, development, <coughs> broadly speaking. But before we go there, you know, you've been in Washington a good while. And one of the uh, more life-affirming uh, uh, responsibilities you had when you were in government was uh, in the Treasury was dealing with Congress. And uh, I am curious if you uh, would describe um, where we are in terms of a, uh, a bipartisan view towards the importance of development. It seems to me that we're in this one area, we are in a better place than we were 15, 20 years ago when you may recall when during the Clinton administration we couldn't, we couldn't get anything out of Congress for the most indebted countries. Uh, I, I wrote a speech for the president that uh, was on IDA, uh, particularly you know tough issue for uh, a democratic administration, but we don't seem to be having those fights anymore. Well, a certain flavor, a certain version of development, I think, does run contrary to the basic Washington reality that bipartisan is not much to be had. Um, uh, so, for example, you know, the two principal arms of the U.S. government that focus on development directly are the, are the USAID, the Agency for International Development, and something called the Millennium Challenge Corporation, MCC. And... Um, both, I think, have enjoyed more bipartisan support of late than, uh, than um, was historically present for U.S. development assistance. Uh, I'd say in particular MCC, which does a lot of its work around kind of um, carefully established metrics for judging progress and um, sort of manages the, the um, assistance that they give much more kind of in, in a much sort of greater private sector orientation than has typically been the case um, uh, in U.S. development assistance. And it was, it, MCC was kind of a creature of, a, of a, essentially a Republican view that that, that different way of, of providing assistance ought to be tried. Having, you know, AID, I think, has had a pretty good run in the last few years in terms of its funding. Um, not perfect, and it's obviously a tight fiscal environment. Where the sort of the bipartisanship um, dissolves quite quickly is in U.S. government support for the international financial institutions. So whether it's funding or governance changes, you know, more or less without wanting to sound unduly partisan, more or less one party in Congress is sort of doctrinally opposed in the main. So we have this strange position of, uh, you know, for example, in the IMF, having proposed or been among the group of countries that proposed a set of important governance changes in 2009. And um, it requires implementing legislation because there's some fiscal implication to the governance adjustments, which is, would essentially change the, the voting um, uh, rights of the developing world commensurate to their economic power which has um, not been the case. Europe's sort of vastly overweighted in the IMF in terms of its votes relative to its global share of GDP, and more or less the BRICs are underweighted, um, just to sort of caricature it. And um, this would be, in the end, net fiscally um, positive for the US government because it would create greater burden for a set of other countries. It would also, I think, make it easier to uh, for the IMF to do a set of things, in, especially in crisis circumstances, and yet um, uh, it, it cannot get through Congress, um, and, it, and it's a, sort of a deeply par partisan issue. So I would say, um, what, what, what do the opponents cite as the problems? Well, I think there's a little bit of just a, um, an allergic reaction to international institutions generally from these opponents. Um, sort of a suspicion that it um, is about uh, devolving U.S. authority, U.S. power to some international thing that they don't quite understand. So there's a piece of that that's kind of just um, at its core. Um, and I think that there's some suspicion that, you know, giving the BRICS, for example, greater voting rights is inconsistent with their version of how the, of how the world should move forward. So I don't, I don't think it's a, I mean, a, they, what is not articulated is, a, at least from my perspective, a particularly coherent, particularly persuasive set of arguments against, but it has now five years in a row 
uh, not made it across the finish line, not even come close, because you know um, the leadership of the Republican Party That's, in Congress is implacably yeah. opposed. So it's it's uh, black helicopters and uh, conceding to uh, Russia. Yeah, I mean that might be the the malign <laughs> the caricature. That might be the malign caricature of okay. it. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of an allergy to international institutions, coupled with uh, you know a suspicion about whether this is um, creating relative power for a set of countries that you know. They don't find completely sympathetic. Okay. All right. Well, why don't we um, move to the macro picture? Because probably nothing will determine uh, the future of the developing world uh, quite as much. So why don't you uh, look in your crystal ball and tell us uh, what you see? I mean, um, I would say, you know, on a global basis, uh, growth is pretty slow. It's pretty uneven. It's pretty fragile. Some sense not that surprising, given what um, a lot of the world's economies went through in 2008-9. Um, I think you know one has to say that the U.S. is doing pretty well on a relative basis, meaning relative to a big chunk of the world. Certainly, the developed world, developed economy world, doesn't feel so you know great or so robust. Um, but it's pretty good and has been persistently pretty good, but not better probably than pretty good for a couple, two, three years now. Pretty steady, I think, pretty steady improvement in labor markets, pretty good growth, pretty low inflation, um, financial markets that are pretty well repaired and doing, you know, the basic job they need to do. Um, you know, the, the IMF, I think, is calling for about 3.5% growth in the U.S., uh, in 2015, I think the markets think it's going to be a little less, probably slightly under three. Um, so in contradistinction to the Eurozone and to Japan, th three and a half or three, even 2.8 seems like a pretty big number because um, the Eurozone is, you know, growing kind of very slowly, kind of one percentish, one percentish ish um, in 2015, probably, it's obviously beset by a set of governance troubles, um, a set of economies that are suffering from a bunch of structural problems, not competitive, huge structural unemployment, especially among youth. It's been persistent. Um, where, that, where that occurs, largely in countries that have pretty unhappy fiscal circumstances and have not that much room to um, be doing the kinds of things that might um, uh, help their their growth and their unemployment picture. Uh, another set of countries in Europe probably do have that space, um, but have a sort of um, uh, a view about fiscal rectitude and about fiscal discipline that has, for the moment, caused them not to. Um, you can name one, yeah. So you know, the, uh, Italy, Spain, France, and the first group. Uh, Germany, the Netherlands, and you know some of the Nordics in the, in the second group, um, and all of that uh, in the context of a governance set of problems where obviously there's uh, at least in the zone, you know only one monetary authority and 17 fiscal authorities, and you know that's proven very complicated kind of serially in Spain, Ireland. Greece, Cyprus, and you know, I guess you could say Greece, Cyprus, <laughs> and Greece again, and Ireland, and then Greece again, and um, and uh, you know, it it turns out, not surprisingly, that a only partially federated concatenation of of sovereigns is a pretty unwieldy thing to manage, um, and even harder to manage when some of it is actually actually is federated and other parts not. And so this combination of governance challenge and structural problems, uh, I think, um, is likely to persist for some time. It's, it's sort of you know, something on which the Europeans have been muddling through now for three years or so and likely to continue muddling. Um, Japan, I think, you know, if you want me to just do a quick tour, um, I think Japan, uh, also very sluggish growth, you know, um, both in Japan and I, I should have said in Europe, very accommodative monetary policies. You know, the central bank's doing kind of what they can. Um, 
while we in the United States have a central bank that looks like they're about to to tighten, the, you know, the central banks in Europe and Japan are kind of going gangbusters. Um, but in Japan, too, kind of structural challenges, fiscal policy, uh, I think, challenges, and um, the monetary policy component piece has not been enough. You know, the, the, the one of, of Prime Minister Abe's three arrows has not been sufficient. And, um, you know, you have in Japan, for example, uh, a labor force that, you know, is very hard to crack if you're a woman. So a big chunk of what would otherwise be available uh, as... Um, as labor and that could contribute to growth is kind of on the sidelines. These are things that the Japanese government, I think, needs to make um, meaningful progress on. In the emerging world, a very uneven set of stories, uh, you know, China growing uh, somewhat more slowly than it has been in recent years as they try to, I think, um, grapple with a set of structural challenges about liberalizing their economy and you know, um, putting more market-based signals into how they distribute capital, how they um, think about interest rates, how they think about currency exchange rates, land reform, uh, obviously a set of things the President Xi is doing on corruption. It's a whole set of things going on that I think in general have been uh, part of a broader effort to reorient the Chinese economy away from its, you know, core export base and in the direction of creating a domestic demand, steady, stable, sustainable domestic demand component at the center of its economy. That's a long process. It's, I think, meant that sort of the unsustainably high growth rates that China has enjoyed for the last five, six, seven, eight years are coming off a bit, I mean, it's coming off meaning just below 7% probably, which feels kind of nice, but for them is, you know, quite complicated. Um, you know, the rest of the emerging world, ex-India, I would say, is, is slowing down pretty noticeably. South Africa, Brazil, certainly Russia, given oil prices. Um, uh, India may be the bright spot. I think that, you know, it looks likely that India will be the fastest growing large economy in the world in 2015. Unclear how much progress uh, Prime Minister Modi will be with respect to a set of structural adjustments that he's trying to pull off. But um, for the moment, India's doing quite well. And um, I think the IMF's calling for global growth around 3.5%, and maybe um, you know, maybe there's some upside to that. I don't know. So since it's in the uh, newspaper every day, you know, uh, more speculation on the collapse of the Eurozone. Um, uh, what, 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 what's the view from, uh, from where you sit on, on that? Is this one seriously, um, well, is this an impending disaster or a seriously overhyped story? And so I'm going to go, I don't think it's either of those. I think it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, a pretty ugly, it's a pretty ugly drama. My, you know, I think the highest probability is that they'll continue to muddle through. It'll be hard to watch. It'll be uneven. There'll be steps forward and two steps back. Um, there'll be plenty of you know late night drama and all night sessions of you know the zones um, heads and also their finance ministers. But I think I think there's a strong conviction across the range of governments, including the Greeks, that you know exiting the exiting the eurozone is a pretty bad outcome, pretty painful outcome, and to be avoided um, uh, in a serious way. So I think there's some chance that they could stumble into a problem. Uh, seems unlikely to me, but not, you know, but not beyond uh, imagination for sure. Um, and uh, you know, this is hard politics, obviously in Athens. It's hard politics in Berlin, uh, uh, and you know, also in other capitals in the eurozone. My, my, you know, I think. I think it's pretty unlikely the whole thing will break apart. I think the, the repercussions of that are, are pretty enormous, um, uh, both for uh, whatever country breaks away and for whichever set of countries are still there. Yeah, well, describe the repercussions for those, uh, for those who remain or the kinds of pressures the currencies would come under if, uh, uh, if, if even one dropped out. Well, I think you know the overwhelming repercussion for the rest of the zone, if one drops out, is that this experiment is you know there to be 
adjusted and that, you know, if one drops out, why shouldn't the second or a third or a fourth? And it's hard to know what the sort of limiting principle is. I think that's a that's a pretty huge challenge to the basic to the basic experiment of the Arizona in the first place. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot of sort of market implications or potential market implications about how the world will think about the euro in that context, which are likely to have, you know, lots of reverberations in the countries that, that remain. And I think for, you know, if it's Greece or whomever, just say Greece, sort of the repricing of their whole economy that was priced, you know, was overwhelmingly euro denominated um, is going to create huge amounts of economic dislocation to individuals, um, to, to small businesses. Um, it's going to be an enormous amount of pain for a long time. So, I, I mean, I, I don't think it's in any, anyone's interest to, to get to that result. I think they all understand that. And yet they all have, you know, a very complicated chunk of politics in their own in their own systems, in their own countries, that needs to get worked through. And so that's, that's why this will be not, not pretty to watch. It hasn't been pretty to watch. It won't, it'll continue not to be so. So let's uh, talk about uh, two of the other um, <laughs> big issues that are uh, sort of affecting economic outcomes and also how, I think how people feel about their participation in their economies. And, the, the one I think that's got, getting so much attention now, and appropriately so, is inequality. And uh, why don't you spin out for us what you think the consequences of this, both the debate and of the realities of uh, income and, and, and property inequality, both in the US and abroad? So let's start in the US. I mean, um, uh, you know, the the... Inequality debate has kind of a moral component. Also has an echo. So um, no one heard it before, I guess. Yeah. It has That's a moral I mean. component. It has uh, an economic component. It has a political component. So the moral component is, you know, more or less, at least, you know, as I grew up, the sort of national narrative was about social mobility and about Horatio Alger and the idea that if you grew up in America and you worked hard and so forth and so on, you could get wherever you wanted to go. And I think that the data are that that's, you know, broadly fictional. It's not impossible, but it's not the basic reality of America. And um, it sort of conflicts with how we think about, in a very real way, with how we think about uh, who we are as the United States. And, um, you know, there's just an awful lot of data that suggests it matters a lot what zip code you were born in and what, you know, the education of your parents happened to be and what the wealth of your family happens to be and that moving from, you know, moving among, you know, deciles or quintiles uh, um, in wealth or in income is an awfully hard thing and a harder thing to do now than it has been uh, in past. And you, you look at, for example, um, the Gini coefficient in the United States that, you know, the basic measure, measured a lot of different ways, but that measures income inequality and wealth inequality and, um, it turns out if you look at the OECD league table, other developed economies, we do pretty poorly, really poorly. I mean, countries across the globe who have, you know, less inequality problems than you would imagine, you know, in your mind's eye, you think of that can't be. Um, so I think it's just inconsistent with how we think of who we are and who we want to be. Secondly, just from a pure, you know, economic perspective, you think about, you know, the... the um, the marginal propensity to consume of you know people with less income is um, is is higher, and so you know inequality is just not good from a macroeconomic perspective. It's we're not just, we're just not generating as much growth as we would if we had income better distributed as a as a country. Um, and then thirdly, just as a political matter, you know, uh, just in terms of. Uh, a big chunk of the country feeling disaffected, not feeling like they have um, a real investment in what the country is or what it will be. You know, there's sort of an increasing division between, um, I would say, political haves, political have-nots, or people who participate in our in our political system in a meaningful way and have their voices heard, and people who don't participate or whose voices are not heard. And I think so. That's a huge problem, and it's a growing problem. Um, you know, if you think about uh, the financial crisis uh, and the aftermath, 
hourly wage levels in the period from you know 08 to today have <coughs> gone up only incrementally and just really in the last few months has there been any noticeable lift and we're talking about you know tenths of percentage points we're not talking about a a big jump whereas asset values have you know just gone through the roof and asset values across asset classes are substantially north of where they were when the financial crisis began. So, you know, people who had wealth and assets have gotten a lot wealthier and have a lot more assets. And people who, um, who uh, make an hourly wage, this is even apart from people unemployed, for example, but people who make an hourly wage have, you know, more or less seen their income completely flat over the period or maybe just fractionally up. And so, the, you know, the, the graph kind of looks like that. And... Um, there's, um, I think, uh, globally, it's, it's important just to get back to the, the place where we started. Um, uh, um, in the emerging and the developing world, I think, um, uh, these are all economies that are, in the main, all economies that are growing. Um, uh, and um, whether they'll turn that growth into poverty reduction and into, you know, uh, making people's lives better will depend not entirely, but importantly, on the extent to which that growth, that's inc inclusive growth and its growth that's distributed ar across a broad swath of their populations. Um, and, you know, some countries have done a better job of it than others. You cited China in your opening. I think, you know, they've made a lot of progress. They still have progress to go. Um, uh, so I think, um, you know, this is a huge, this is a huge um, focus of, of the current administration in Washington. It's a huge focus in the G20. If you read, you know, if you look, for example, at the, the last G20 leaders meeting in Brisbane, the declaration, there's a lot of focus on these, these questions of inclusion. Um, and I think really for all the three dimensions that we talked about because of the moral, the economic, and the political Implications. Are there any uh, uh, sort of examples of uh, how not to do this? Uh, places w which are growing, which where people perhaps aren't going to be in the streets, but uh, uh, where nonetheless the distribution is uh, is really bad and ultimately uh, going to cause problems. I mean, I think it's pretty well correlated. The, the inclusion part, as you expect, is pretty well correlated, although not entirely, with. Um, with democratic politics, with, with inclusive politics. And I think that, um, you know, you've seen some developing countries whose, you know, uh, economic growth has, you know, uh, largely been on the back of commodity kinds of um, development and exports in places where the politics is not well distributed and you, you know, you tend to see uh, uh, inclusion not at the top of the list, in some places, um, you know that's uh, that risks the that risks the creation of you know a political backlash over time. I, I, you know, I think um, there's some of that in the Middle East among oil exporters, um, for example. Uh, there's some of that in in Africa uh, with governments that are not inclusive, where the economy is hugely tethered to you know one or another kind of extractive. Commo sort of commodity-based um, revenue generation. So the big uh, jolt in the global economy of the last uh, year or so has been the collapse of energy prices. What kind of uh, impact do you think that will have on the macroeconomic picture and, by extension, <coughs> political stability? Well, I think by itself, um, the decrease in global energy price, global oil prices, has been a net contributor. Um, it's hard to know the net contributor to global growth. It's hard to know what the magnitudes are because there are tons of puts and takes. And um, but if you think about it, for countries that are energy importers, which is most countries, um, uh, you know, you could think of it as a, a windfall to consumers in the form of a, you know uh, lower prices that have and will produce some you know increased consumption effect. It's a boon to, to businesses, um, in at least non-energy related businesses, we'll come back to energy related businesses, as a, a cheaper input into whatever, or indirectly an input to an input, um, which presumably will help them 
um, in terms of the, their cost of, of inputs, probably um, leading to, to more you know, investment capital expenditure. And to governments, I think, in lots of places across the world, it creates some opportunity from a fiscal perspective to, get, to, um, uh, to cut energy subsidies or to not have to pay as much energy subsidy relative to an energy price that is a lot lower than it used to be. All these are you know, um, pro-growth, sort of salutary moves from an economic perspective. Um, if you're in a country that's an energy export, obviously it's the other way around in general. I mean, if you think about Russia or Iraq or um, Venezuela, just to take three examples, um, this has been a you know, kind of a brutal period of fiscal uh, of fiscal pressure because all that revenue that used to generate is now getting you know generated at 0.5 what it used to be more or less, um, and then um, in the in the developed world, in particular in the U.S., where we have, you know, obviously an enormously strong energy sector, in some sense, um, you know, you could think of the decrease in energy prices as being meaningfully, but not entirely, the result of um, of supply conditions, largely supply conditions that have, you know, um, uh, manifested themselves here in North America, in the U.S. and Canada. Um, you know the what used to be an economic investment is probably, you know, um, not so clearly economic anymore in a world in which, you know, you, you can sell energy for half of what you used to. So there's plenty of puts and takes, lots of dislocation, but I think good for the U.S. economy, you know, there's a pretty big and deep literature now on what the, what the magnitudes are, but it could be, you know, a full percent of GDP, for example, in the U.S. relative to the alternative. And and good for the for the global economy as well. Um, of course, this, you know the energy um, market uh, developments haven't occurred in a vacuum, and there are puts and takes you know across the board. But I think in general, pretty good thing for the world's economy that you know hundred dollar barrel oil is now plus or minus fifty dollars a barrel. And uh, oh, in terms <clears throat> of stability, is that yeah. <laughs> um, Well, you know, it's. It, I think the the. It's certainly it, the story is not yet. You know, obviously fully written. I think um, it's putting a set of countries under a lot of pressure. Um, sort of instability in Venezuela, instability in Russia. That's kind of multifactorial, but this is an important part of it. Um, uh, um, I think it's complicated for Iraq, it's complicated for Libya, it's complicated for Nigeria, um, for Iran. I, for Iran. Um, I, I don't think we're seeing for the moment sort of real instability concerns that are the direct result of, of energy price decreases, maybe with the exception of Venezuela which you know, wasn't exactly precisely stable beforehand. It's obviously headed south. That's probably got a meaningful energy component to it. Um, I mean, it's hard to, I think it's hard to assert that we have real instability concerns now or on the horizon in Russia, Iran. We have them in Iraq, but they're not principally about energy. Um, so I think you know, it's a thing to be focused on and to be kind of concerned about. And it has real implications for the, these countries to be able to deliver to their people what they have been delivering. But for the moment, I think not in a way that's you know, about you know, regime change or real sort of popular instability in a, in a sort of serious way. So I'd like to uh, turn it over to the audience in, in just a moment. But um, I wanted to ask you first about um, uh, two theses that are being uh, uh, propagated by your former boss and, and, and colleague, Larry Summers. Uh, one of them uh, he put out in an op-ed in the Washington Post yesterday uh, in which he argued that the past month may be remembered as the moment that the United States lost its role as the underwriter of the global economic system. And he tied that to the politics. He has a way with the words, doesn't he? He does. Or, or a very good editor at the Washington Post. I don't think uh, so much that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you would know his prose better. 
Um, and that's one argument. The other is that he and former Fed chairman Ben Bernanke are in a very interesting and rich debate over whether or not there is something, and I'll let you interpret what the phrase means, called secular stagnation in, uh, in the US and the West. Uh, so two big, hu huge issues, and you have to uh, comment on them in about two minutes. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that, um, I think, uh, Larry is right on the first point, which is to say that um, uh, the leadership of the U.S. and the global economy is not sort of foreordained. It's not some divine, you know, thing, um, and that it matters a lot as to um, how we conduct ourselves from a policymaking perspective. He points out that you know, it's hard to be a global leader uh, in the economic sphere when, you know, half your Congress is pretty much implacably opposed to participation in some of these international financial institutions, and the other half has a sort of allergic reaction to trade agreements, and that that's not a good recipe for um, sort of a continued leadership role. And, um, you know, apart from anything else, uh, if you look at the share of the global economy that the U.S. represents, it's, it's declined over time as the growth that you were talking about earlier has taken place. So China, I think, was you know, roughly 3% of GDP in 1990. It's now approaching 14%. Um, uh, you know, Africa has grown, on average, 5% in the last six years or so. India is doing you know, OK. But our share of global GDP is diminishing. And you'd expect, on that basis, for our sort of capacity to be the the only kind of economy that rises above the tide line to recede. Having said that, we still are the in, in sort of the the only sort of irreducibly important economy. You know, the, the central economy in the in the globe. We still have the biggest economy, although that may not last a whole lot longer. Um, we still have um, the world's reserve currency. We still have the biggest, deepest. Uh, most important capital markets on the planet, and we still are the overwhelming generator on a global basis of innovation and technology. And those are things that aren't so hard to replace. I mean, it, it's um, I think it's going to be a long time before you know even two of those go away. Um, and so, um, in that sense, I don't think he's right. Meaning, uh, I think there are a set of decisions coming out of Washington, or, or as it happens, mostly indecisions uh, in the way Washington works, um, where it's always better to take the under than the over on action, um, that um, will erode over time our sort, of, um, our sort of first among equal status. But I think we will, but it will only erode it. It will not, um, it will not replace it. So that's the short, sorry, that's the very condensed version of that answer. On secular stagnation, I mean, the thesis that Summers has uh, um, articulated with some fanfare is that post-financial crisis, post-global recession, the world, the US and the world are unlikely to return to sort of pre-recession um, trend, trend rates of growth. Um, uh, um, having to do with labor productivity and a set of you know, factors that um, he thinks will um, sort of suppress growth levels. I mean, I think it's. I think it's. Um, I think there's no reason to think that that's um, that that's true as a matter of theory. Um, uh, we are suffering from a, a recovery, as we talked about at the very beginning. That's kind of um, uh, annoyingly slow. But you know, you could imagine, um, and there's a set of political constraints that have you know helped cause that. So you could imagine a Congress that was prepared to invest in the infrastructure of the United States or in basic R&D that would create jobs today and that would create a strong framework for growth in the intermediate and the longer term. Um, you know, uh, if, if Summers means, which I think is not what he means, um, that right now the political stars are not well aligned to create a, a path of that sort that would return us to our our you know pre-recession growth rate, then he's right. But if he means that you know um, it's it's theoretically not available to us, I, I don't see why why we should think that. 
And um, you know, if you look at growth rates across the world, you see India accelerating. Um, I think um, you know e Europe and and Japan, if they did the right things, you know, um, hard as they are politically, again could you know get to a, a sort of a, a pre recession trend line or even better conceptually. Okay, thanks very much. Let's open it up to uh, members of the audience who will, I'm sure, have more informed questions than I have. Yes. Um, I'm very happy to have you both um, discuss the issue of inequality. And I'd like to relate that back to your initial um, two factors you identified for the reduction of poverty. One was an economic one, an opening up of markets. And the second one was um, a political one, more uh, democratization in countries. Um, why are you so hopeful that democracy is going to work in developing countries in um, reducing inequality when it really hasn't, it doesn't seem to be working in developed countries based on recent research. That the you know, uh, default um, situation for capitalism is inequality. You know, we, developed countries have the most democracy. So I'm wondering, you know, are we gonna, I'm a little more skeptical that in, in the less developed countries we're gonna end up at the same place. So I think it's good to be skeptical about these things. My, my basic conviction is that democratic politics is more responsive and therefore relative to the alternatives, more likely to produce more inclusive outcomes. It's a relative point. Um, and it's not a substitute for good policies and for strong institutions and so forth in a particular place. Um, but I think that there's a lot of data to suggest that you know, uh, democratic politics and inclusion are well correlated. Um, so that's my that's my basic thesis. Um, I think also, you know, uh, in some cases in these in the developing world, for example, there's just a lot more low hanging fruit. I mean, there's still, as we talked about at the beginning, lots and lots, hundreds of millions, maybe even a billion people who are in extreme poverty, and I'd be somewhat cautious about superimposing our own particular dysfunctional brand of politics on any other country. I mean, I think it's, I mean, even, in, even within democratic politics, our kind of um, reasonably unique separation of powers structure is you know, not much um, extant anywhere else. But I don't think I think you're right to to suggest it's not a it's not a preordained thing. It's not if X then Y. I think that it's rather that um, a pretty important condition for the proper amount of inclusion and therefore the proper amount of progress on inequality and on poverty reduction is a government that's responsive that cares about the parts of its society that are broadly you know, defined in the category of have-nots. So I don't want to overclaim the point, but I think it is an important piece of the, of the dynamic. Professor Samley. So in your opening remarks, you talked about um, how the story of global <coughs> poverty reduction has a large emphasis on China. And then you started talking about international institutions and how this might spread. I, I think China is idiosyncratic in the following way. Here's, here are the three things that I think happened in China. Number one, they got very organized around producer interests in an export-led framework. <coughs> Number two, we opened our markets to them nearly unconditionally, and uh, that generated, um, I think, a symbiotic relationship. And the third piece is we didn't engage them militarily like we've engaged other countries over the prior century that we perceive to be a threat, <coughs> right? So you could imagine a very different aftermath of the fall of the Berlin Wall um, where we didn't take an aggressive, where we, we did take an aggressive posture against China 
and we kept them down, like we kept the Soviet Union down, or we tried to keep Japan down. So it's really, it's those three things. The two things we can do is try to act peacefully toward these countries. Um, we can open our markets. And then the one thing that those countries have to do is they have to get organized around exporting and take advantage of the opportunities that they've been given. What's nice about China is they figured that out, and we worked together over the last 25 years to make that happen. So, so let me, so here's how I'd respond, how I'd react to that. I think um, on your sort of point about war, I think there's no question, but, and I should have included that physical security is kind of a prerequisite to the kind of development we're talking about. So there's different versions of that, whether it's the US or some other thing. Um, so that's absolutely right. Um, has to be physical security, um, which is a challenge in lots of parts of the world. But I'd say, you know, big um, sort of economically relevant, macroeconomically relevant conflict, I'd say is, you know, if you graphed it, is, is less than it was, not just the US and China, but, you know, I, I think there's a sort of a secular trend in that direction, uh, I'll assert. Um, second, on trade, I think. Um, uh, we opened our markets. I think, you know, this is the point I tried to make about um, market economics, whether it's trade or investment, direct foreign investment. I think that's been an important component, having market forces, the private sector play uh, an increasing role and not just the official sector, not just um, aid. And then third, I don't. I don't necessarily. I don't think I subscribe to the idea that you know um, having it oriented around. It, it worked for China, f for sure. But I don't think that um, having kind of an export oriented. It's worked for others. I mean, clearly, uh, in particular in Asia, um, uh, is you know the only path. It may be a path. It's probably not the right path if you think about it. You know, over a longer arc of time. But it's to me that's another point about you know market orientation and having the. Um, ability both inward and outward to participate in a global economy where you know goods and, and capital move and where um, you know private the private sector will in that circumstance um, help contribute to to growth by engaging and by participating in commerce so sometimes that'll be exports sometimes you know not necessarily I mean um, India is doing a version of it now that's not particularly export driven for example What do you think accounts for increasing income inequality, and are there policies that can be pursued that would mitigate those inequalities without putting a damper on growth? So I think the basic dynamic of the, dynamic of the last five years is what I described, sort of you know um, asset valuations that have made the wealthy wealthier and um, income levels that have basically been flattish. So there's been a separation. I think there are a lot of policy things. You know, um, uh, you could think about um, tax policy uh, um, paths toward um, greater uh, toward greater distribution of income or wealth. Um, you could think about increasing the minimum wage so that people at the at the bottom of the, of the income scale can um, generate more hourly wages, more, more income in general. You could think about government investment in things that would create more jobs and create a little wage pressure in the, in the labor markets. Um, you could think about the government over a longer horizon of time uh, investing more in education at all, at all age levels, early childhood education, um, uh, primary and secondary education and higher education as um, a means toward um, generating more opportunity, more income ultimately for uh, for folks. I think you know there's a there's a basket of of policy ideas that I think would um, you know you could dial those up, you could dial them back, you could do the combination. There's a whole set of there's a rich menu of, of policy options that one could choose among. To um, if one wanted to make progress on this on this set of things, um, it's proven to be a, sort of for the moment um, a set of things that can't get over the finish line in Congress. Now most things can't get over the finish line in Congress. I mean it's, it's damn near impossible to get something over the finish line in Congress. But um, 
you know, there's an increasingly active debate about these topics. The president obviously is spending a ton of time on it, but increasingly you see, for example, Republican candidates for president starting to talk about inequality issues because I think they realize, back to my sort of taxonomy, that there's a bunch of politics in this issue and that there are a lot of people in this country who have increasingly felt like they're, both Democrats and Republicans, by the way, traditionally, who sit in a place where they feel like, you know, progress is passing them by and are quite unhappy about that, understandably, and are therefore ripe for, you know, politicians who, you know, talk about it and have one or another set of ideas about how one can make progress on it. Yes. So after the tension shifts away from Iran and the nuclear deal, deal and goes back to Russia, do you think that adding more sanctions will unnecessarily provoke them? Or do you think the administration will continue adding them? Or will uh, the EU be opposed to increasing them? So I think the answer to that question depends a lot on what uh, Vladimir Putin and the Russian government do. Um, I think that you know the US has been in this complicated uh, position of um, trying to create some price that is associated with bad behavior, want to create you know enough price that it registers in the in the calculus uh, of Putin or hopes or that's the that's the uh, the aspiration, but not and as you suggest, not so much price that it you know causes sort of additional bad behavior. Um, so you know there's a might be a tipping point in there. Um, uh, at the same time, I think you know the U.S. has been very conscious of um, having this regime be multilateral, both because sanctions regimes, when they're not multilateral, tend not to be at all effective, um, and also because they've been keen not to disadvantage U.S. businesses relative to, for example, European businesses in energy relationships and banking relationships and other kinds of relationships with Russian counterparts. Um, so the U.S. government's kind of been threading this complicated needle. Um, the sanctions regime really not that robust relative to lots of other sanctions regimes we have. I think what they said is they want to um, calibrate it relative to bad behavior. Even judging what's bad behavior is complicated because you know Putin shows up in Minsk and he makes an agreement and then he backtracks, but very subtly or very opaquely, and then you know there's an impulse to try to lay on some additional sanctions, and then Putin goes back and meets um, you know, uh, with Mr. Yukashenko, and then they sort of seem to paper it over. And so there's been this kind of complexity around actually identifying and being sufficiently confident of bad behavior that not only uh, the US Congress would be for it, but, um, but importantly, Europe would be for it. And of course, you know, Europe is much more entangled with Russia f- commercially, and, um, gets a lot of its energy supply from Russia, so that's a higher hurdle. My instinct is that um, on the current path, meaning if you assume that you know Putin's kind of mucking around a little bit in eastern Ukraine, things in Crimea stay more or less where they are, which is firmly with Russia. Um, there's a bunch of agitation in a set of you know regions of Ukraine, but not sort of full out hot conflict. Um, and Putin sort of gives lip service every month or two to trying to cobble a way forward that takes adequate account of Russian interests while preserving basic Ukrainian sovereignty or some version of that, um, that there won't be a huge impulse to ratchet up, at least not meaningfully, sanctions here in the U.S., and that more importantly, and to your point, that it'll be very hard to push new sanctions over the finish line in Brussels. Um, even before pushing new sanctions over the finish line in Brussels, you know, the, the European sanctions roll off every six months. Um, and it'll be hard to sustain what's already in place in a circumstance where, you know, there's lots of business agitation in Germany and in France and elsewhere to want to continue to do business with Russia. And, you know, people are worried about energy supply. <coughs> no, no, you. Hi. Um, so I'm curious about, uh, after talking about pivoting the discussion around poverty alleviation and really outlining maybe foreign direct investment, opening up markets as a solution, but isn't there also a narrative that critiques growth as a solution all the time and particularly um, 
as it displaces people through dam, dam construction or pollution is an emergent problem and textured to growing concerns of an environmental crisis. When you talk about countries like India, that's 1.3 almost billion people. That what, what really is the end picture of the type of well-being that an individual has across, if we're talking also about global inequalities? So I don't think that um, growth by itself, you know, uh, produces the result that we're seeking. Um, so, you know, uh, as I suggested, I think you need, you know, um, y it matters how that growth is distributed. It matters the quality of policy choices in a particular country. Um, I think all those things are absolutely true. I don't think of growth by, I think growth by itself creates conditions which make po poverty alleviation much easier as a general matter. Um, I think it matters a ton about, uh, as we talked about inclusion, I would say, by the way, you know, in India, for example, particularly inclusion of, of women, I think it makes a lot of difference the extent to which people are connected to the organized financial system. So for example, a billion people in extreme poverty, I think it's something like two and a half billion people across the globe, no access to, a formal, uh, to the formal financial sector, no ability to access credit, no ability to save money, except under the mattress. Um, so I think there's a component of it that has to do with um, financial access, credit access. Uh, I think, uh, you know, for sure, um, environmental concerns uh, need to take need to be taken account of. So there's a set of things. I don't mean to sort of, you know, elide them or or wash them away, but um, you know, I think one can imagine. We should imagine. We and we should be pushing hard for. Um, uh, growth that's well distributed, that um, is on the back of um, you know good access to reasonable paying jobs, some connectivity to something that looks like the financial sector. That doesn't have to be a bank; it could be a cell phone. Um, uh, that is you know where technology is is taken advantage of. Um, uh, I mean, I think that that's uh, that's not you know, the least bit beyond imagination. I'd be just curious if that requires any concessions of, you know, people living in America or to accommodate a sustainable global model that there are also changes that have to happen simultaneously in developed countries. Well, I think, you know, the easy answer, the sort of easy place where that would likely to be the case or the easy kind of in immediate case is on climate change. So that's, you know, I think there's going to have to be, um, I don't know if accommodation is quite the right thing, but certainly a set of adjustments and a, you know, a set of things that will have to make the way we go about living and the way we consume energy different. I don't think that um, I don't think it's in the cards. Just as a practical matter, if if you think about sort of direct development assistance or the provision of you know money, or that kind of thing, I don't think that's so. That's one version. What could be one version of accommodation on the part of developed countries? It's not happening. It's not happening both because, um, frankly, the fiscal positions of the developed world are just not you know don't don't allow for that. And moreover, there's not enough there's not enough money in the developed world to by itself, you know, cause the change we're talking about. This is why these things have to be largely, you know, um, indigenously produced, with know-how, with help on you know institution building, on capacity, um, on technology, on a set of things that are tools toward those ends. But um, I think this is you know just to, to go back to the very beginning of the colloquy with. But Dan, um, I think this has been, you know, what I've just said in the last minute is sort of roughly reflective of the broad sea change in thinking about development from, you know, where the world was thinking about it 30 years ago or 40 years ago. And, um, you know, there are increasingly good models and, you know, uh, successful stories that one can look at. They're not necessarily graftable from one context to another, but they have in them um, you know, the power of example and a set of learnings and a, and a you know, a, a set of potential choices that, you know, governments um, have been making, can make, um, which are brought in the right direction. Look, look, just in case, I mean, I don't, want, I don't want to sound Pollyannish or overly sanguine. This is all ridiculously hard stuff. I mean, this is not, you know, wave a wand and, and it will happen even over some huge period of time. 
I'm just saying it's, it's possible, and here are the things that strike me as being roughly uh, important um, uh, to success or correlate with success, and then there are a set of downside risks you know, that we haven't spent a lot of time talking about, but um, you know, corruption, rule of law problems, uh, physical insecurity, political instability, uh, you know, um, disasters of a range of sorts, meteorological, geological, we, I think, you know, post Ebola, we have to say, you know, biological, a set of things where um, over small or intermediate increments of time, the thing could, you know, go south, not north, in any particular geography across a set of geographies. There's no question, a lot of downside risk that one needs to factor in. So this is not, this is, there's, you know, there are no layups here. This is like really tough, hard stuff. Um, but I think, you know, more and more, it strikes me that it's within grasp. You, you just committed a sports metaphor, but it's the day after the NCAA. Sorry, so sorry. we'll let you slide on that one. Is that like, is that like a deep Dartmouth <laughs> role, no sports yeah. metaphor? Well, you know, we're, we're progressing here. Got it. Yes. Can you comment on the micro loan program in the third world? I understand parts of it have been quite successful, and how much is the U.S. committed to that program? So I don't know whose micro loan program you're talking about. There's a lot of them out there. There are some uh, that are sponsored by the international financial institutions uh, and uh, the regional development banks. Um, there are um, now plenty that are. Um, either sponsored directly or done under the auspices of various governments. And then there's a, quite a booming private sector um, effort in microcredit, microinsurance, across you know, all kinds of geographies in Africa, in Southeast Asia, in Latin America. Um, you know, I think they're making pretty good headway. In some countries, they're much further advanced than other places. Um, but I think, you know, uh, you're talking about, again, this is sort of market signals that are being used. Um, and I think that a lot of potential, a lot of potential. I mean, I have a friend who uh, runs a thing in the U.S. called Axion, which is a big kind of global microcredit thing. Do you, do you know Axion? Oh, yeah, Axion, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, they're busy, they're busy investing in and buying, frankly, microcredit um, uh, programs, sometimes it's a slice of a financial institution, sometimes a standalone, sometimes it's affiliated with a telecoms company. There's a, th there's a lot of flavors of this. And, um, you know, I think, uh, I think it's really, um, it's, you know, in lots of places doing great work in terms of Getting people access to credit that they would not otherwise have, with which they can, you know, build their lives by, you know, start small businesses, send their kids to school, you know, the, the things that are about, um, you know, meeting their aspirations and and getting out of poverty and, you know, in the direction of the middle class and so forth and so on. And I think that there's now been a lot of empirical evidence that this can be also be successful business, meaning it's not, you know, it's not doesn't need to be, oughtn't be, probably, in, in, in order for it to be sustainable. Uh, kind of an, uh, an eleemosynary activity or an aid activity. It's, you know, um, I mean, I think, I don't, so start, you know, so I think the, um, big potential. I mean, a lot of success and more potential. Does the Treasury have any money in it? So no public money, meaning the Treasury hasn't invested in this, but um, we have... Um, been involved in providing technical assistance to governments who want to do this. Um, we stay engaged with the uh, international financial institutions on these topics, um, support them you know, at the bank and at the African Development Bank and so forth, and then have spent some amount of time uh, engaging with private sector entities, both um, uh, you know, traditional financial institutions and also kind of specialist microcredit um, uh, efforts of one flavor or another um, in, you know, in Africa and Asia and Latin America. Yes. Uh, would you speak to the theme of population growth as a cause of poverty and 
whether there's any consensus among financial institutions um, to address that. To address population growth? Right. Policies or whatever. Um, so, um, I think no, not so much. You know, the, 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 it's a very fraught, it's a very fraught lane in which to, this is a sports metaphor, in which to swim. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, um, I mean, I think the, so for example, the US government doesn't really have a policy on these questions, um, per se. Uh, and I think that, um, I mean, well, of course it's true that, um, uh, I mean, and by the way, population growth is a mixed is a mixed blessing. So you know, a bunch of growth that one could expect, macro growth, so uh, that one could expect in the developing world will come from demography. You know, lots more people who are participating in the labor force, a lot more sort of economic activity therefore, and so on and so on. It obviously creates for any increment of economic growth, the more people you have to apply to, it's you know harder to um, do so in an inclusive way or to lift people out of out of out of poverty, but I certainly didn't spend any time on sort of thinking about, I'm not aware that much of Treasury or the US government broadly. So you can't, you know, you can't, statutorily, you can't get yourself involved in really much of family planning or birth control. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a third rail of, of politics and sort of verboten to, uh, to the, the, the government. Um, But I, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of the, I think you're right, obviously the, the patterns of growth uh, in lots of places have a, you know, a very important demographic component, sort of, you know, as age cohorts are sort of sliding through the, through the chart. Is this a question? Uh, yes. Oh, mm -hmm. great. Okay. Um, Thank you. Uh, something that I noticed is how you were saying how growth and equality is tightly related. I was wanting to know that um, considering there's only so many things that we can do to improve one without discouraging the other, is one day us as a country, do you think we're going to have to choose one over the, over the other? Do you think that's eventually going to happen? So the um, answer is we shouldn't have to. Um, you know, I think uh, good policy making um, uh, will help us in the direction of growth and growth that's reasonably well distributed so that it, you know, it contributes toward the reduction of inequality, not the other way around. But it's not foreordained and it, it matters a lot how you, how you organize your society and how you organize policy. So, you know, I wouldn't say that, that, um, that uh, growth's not a precondition to equality, and, um, and they're not, you know, this, they're obviously not the same thing, but I do think that easier to, you know, easier to, just to use this metaphor, easier to distribute a pie that's growing than one that's static. Um, uh, but I don't, there's certainly no conceptual um, uh, tension between growth and, and um, either poverty reduction or even, um, or even equality, uh, um, and it, you know, in the end, it makes all the difference what what choices one makes about how to run an economy and how to run, you know, economic policy, social policy. So um, we're coming to a close. I want to uh, abuse the prerogative of the chair to ask <coughs> one last question. You uh, uh, said before there's no wand, and I think we can stipulate that that's true, but. Um, you know, you've uh, you've certainly uh, given at the office for many years and been uh, uh, made the government uh, work in many important ways. Let's assume for just one minute that you are president, <laughs> and uh, you know what a horrible how, country that would be. <laughs> I think it'd be a pretty good country, actually. <laughs> um, we, um, you know, the land of Neil or something. But um, if you, uh, knowing, knowing how politics works and you had uh, a deep desire to uh, make poverty reduction uh, a very high priority for the United States, but you really could only emphasize uh, or get a big dollop of funding for one uh, thing to focus on that you don't think we're doing enough of, 
Uh, what would that be? Would it be um, capacity building so that there are bureaucrats and economists who can, who can run governments? Would it be women and girls' education? Uh, would it be uh, democracy, uh, uh, pro-democracy policies? Uh, you have to sell it to the American On public. On a global basis? On a global basis. And if it's really tough, you can use a so, sports metaphor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank God. Um, so, I, you know, I don't know what the answer to that question is. I guess um, I think inclusion is at, the, is at the heart of it. And I think um, if you think about sort of the lion's share of, of disenfranchisement economically, it's with women. Um, I think uh, sort of embedded in your question is what could I get over the finish line in terms of political success? I'd be tempted to go after you know economic inclusion of women, um, uh, participating in labor markets, which uh, is a big challenge, you know, across the developing world in lots of places. Financial inclusion in terms of access to credit. It feels like you know on a bang for the buck basis and on a you know probability of sick political success and pushing it over the finish line within the context of US politics, then on those bases, that might be the kind of the place I spend some time. Well, that's a great answer. And uh, I can see that I was effectively transmitting that idea to you really well, because I was hoping you'd go there. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> this is just a set piece, folks. <laughs> Uh, it's been a great pleasure having you, Neil, and uh, really a wonderful, uh, a wonderful event uh, to uh, bring this kind of insight into uh, the economy and the world of uh, poverty alleviation uh, here to the Upper Valley. So thanks so much for coming. Thanks for having me.